listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and thank you so much for joining me today. Today, I wanted to take some time to talk about a psychological theory or framework that I have found really, really helpful when thinking about my own internal dialogue and my dialogue with other people as well. This is called transactional analysis. Before we start, I just want to add the caveat that I'm not a trained psychology professional and nor am I a trained transactional analysis therapist either. I very much have a layperson's interest in this subject. So if you listen to this podcast and it's something that you're interested in finding out more about, I would highly suggest reading a book called Games People Play, The Basic Handbook of Transactional Analysis by Eric Byrne. There's another book as well called I'm Okay, You're Okay, and I can't remember who it's by off the top of my head. I haven't read it myself, but I've heard very good things about it from other people. And the link to both those books will be in the show notes. So what is transactional analysis? As I said, it's a psychological theory, and it was developed by Eric Byrne in the 1950s. It looks at the dynamics in our relationships with other people, and more importantly, in our relationship with ourselves. Most of us are aware on one level or another of the internal dialogue that goes on in our head. And this might be as simple as you walk into a coffee shop and there's this really delicious looking cake there. And you've got the angel on one shoulder saying, no, don't eat the cake. And you've got the picture waving devil on the other shoulder going, eat the cake, eat the cake. You know, you want to. Um, So sometimes it can be relatively black and white like that and you're kind of stuck in the middle thinking should I eat the cake should I not eat the cake I don't know I really want the cake but on the other hand I know it'd be good not to eat the cake at other times it's more complicated than that and it's like there's a whole board meeting going on in our heads and this can be really really challenging because usually it provokes lots of quite uncomfortable feelings like ambivalence uncertainty and just not knowing the answer What transactional analysis does is it divides these voices into three different roles. So it divides them into parent voices, adult voices, and child voices. The basic principles of transactional analysis are, number one, everyone is okay just as they are. Number two, everybody has the capacity to think for themselves. Number three, We have the ability to decide on the path of our life, meaning that we can choose to change this course at any time. And to me, when I when I read about these principles for the first time, this all sounded pretty good because I really like the emphasis on personal freedom that's in there. So the fact that, yeah, we we are responsible for our lives and we can change the path at any time. It's not going to be easy, but it is possible. And also, I really like the encouraging, positive, and inspiring aspects of this. So yeah, this this sense of self-belief. We are okay just as we are. We don't necessarily need to change. And that we all have the capacity to think for ourselves. Let's look at the three parts, parent, adult, and child, more closely. First of all, I'll talk about the parent part. So unless you were raised by wolves, which is highly unlikely, you would have had a primary caregiver. This is the person who took care of you as a child. It might have been your mother, your father, an extended family member, or someone biologically unrelated to you. So that could be a a nanny, an au pair, even a foster parent, or anyone like that. Whoever they were, our primary caregivers had a huge effect on our development and personalities. Even if we didn't get along with them, we internalized some of the beliefs and behavior patterns that they exposed us to as children especially those we needed to in order to survive. As adults, this gives us the parent voice. Some of these messages, such as basic moral codes, are useful, but many are not. The parent voice can be highly critical of you and others around you. It's the voice with all the, quote, shoulds. It's the voice telling you that you need to do better, be faster, stronger, and work harder, because if you don't, then that's not good enough. It might also be a voice telling you not to do something, that you're likely to fail. To give a personal example about this, when I was a teenager, I remember my mother saying to me once, Oh, I saw Joe Bloggs and Susie Q, who are two friends of mine, talking outside school today. He seems to like her. 
Susie was wearing some really nice jeans. Maybe if you wore clothes like that, he'd like you too. And for me, that and other incidents led me to internalize this message. People aren't going to like you for who you are. You don't bring enough to the table as a person, so you better have something else that's good to offer. Of course, sometimes the inner parent can produce useful side effects too. The message I was just talking about which revolved around me not being enough as a person, really motivated me to perform very well academically, to get good grades, to work hard, and also to be an independent, self-sufficient person, not to need anything from anyone, to just be able to get on with things myself. And I would definitely have rather done all of that out of a sense of self-worth rather rather than feeling like I had something to prove. And I, I have very mixed feelings about it now because there was some really unpleasant, emotional consequences of having those kinds of interactions. At the same time, I'm also aware that as a result of them, I did develop a really strong work ethic. It's always very difficult to look back and imagine this parallel universe where you didn't have those kinds of interactions. But I I also know that in, in a strange way, it has benefited me in the sense that I have worked very hard in my life and I have had opportunities as a result of working hard that I might not have otherwise had. This is why the parent voice can be so hard to dismiss. In its own twisted way, it is acting to protect you from rejection and failure. Unfortunately, unless the adult part, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, is good at meeting the parent and calming it, its extreme methods usually lead to us feeling rejected and feeling like failures anyway. The second voice I'm going to talk about is the child voice. The child part is just as it sounds. It's the part that never grew up. Transactional analysis works with the idea that parts of us remain stuck in particular times, like a record of our experiences. When faced with similar situations in the future, that tape gets replayed, meaning we might still be reacting to a situation when we're 30 in the same way we did when we were 7. So as an example, let's say a parent or primary caregiver repeatedly expresses anger when you forget to finish your homework as a child. 30 years later, you get an email from your boss asking about that project that you were supposed to hand in yesterday, the project that you had completely forgotten about. Your heart starts racing, your hands shake, you envisage your boss getting angry, and you imagine you'll probably get fired for this gross transgression. When you finally pluck up the courage to talk to your boss, they shrug and say, it's not a big deal, just email it over as soon as possible. After the initial flood of relief, you wonder why you got so upset to begin with. There are positive and joyful aspects to the child voice as well, aspects it's important not to lose. This is the part that laughs unreservedly, sings loudly, and dances with no inhibitions. It's the part that's extremely playful and knows how to let go, relax, and just be in the moment. The adult part represents our ability to react to life based on information we have at hand. This is the part that is rational, empathetic, and responsible. As we grow older, the adult part takes precedence over the parent and child parts and acts as a mediator between the two. I think the best summary I've seen of the difference between the parts is summed up on a website called Business Balls, and I've put the link to that in the show notes below. What this website says is that parent is our taught concept of life, adult is our thought concept of life, and child is our felt concept of life. And what might be helpful for you is just taking a few moments to think about what patterns, feelings, or reactions can you attribute to each part. Next, I want to spend a few moments talking about how this affects our interactions. TA, as I'm going to call it from now on because it's quite a mouthful to say transactional analysis every time, breaks human interactions into two categories. Complementary transactions happen when both parties are communicating with the same part, for example, adult to adult. Cross transactions happen when one person is communicating with one part and the other with a different part, for example, parent to child. Cross transactions are easy to get into. If someone speaks to me with a parental subtext, it is more likely to bring out my child part than if someone spoke to me in an adult subtext. Unless we're both aware of what's happening and can get back to an equal level, this can lead to some very problematic interactions. These interactions play out in what Eric Byrne calls games. In his book, he lists over 100 different games, so I'm just going to talk about the most common in this episode. 
Um, as I said earlier, if you want to know more about TA and more about the games themselves, they are in his book, Games People Play. The tricky thing about games is that on a social level, they can appear to be an adult-adult interaction. However, on an emotional level, the interaction is usually parent-child. The first game I'm going to talk about is called Yes, But. We can probably all relate to having either been on the receiving end of someone who is stuck in a Yes, But pattern or getting stuck in a yes but pattern ourselves. And personally, this is one of the games that I find most frustrating to be on the receiving end of. The scenario. In this game, the agent, which is the person instigating the game, starts by presenting a problem. Person B responds with, why don't you insert suggestion here? To which person A replies, yes, but, or the problem is, or something similar. If you recognize the situation, you'll probably know that it can go on for hours. And I think out of all the games in the book, this is probably the one for me that pushes my buttons most, partly because if I'm not aware of what is happening in the moment, I'm quite susceptible to getting sucked into yes but games as the person making the suggestions. So for example, if someone comes to you and says, oh, I just can't stand another minute at my job and I'm, I'm ready to quit and my boss is a nightmare and I'm just so miserable. And you say, well, why don't you have a look for, for another job? And they say, yeah, well, I could, but it's just, it's a really difficult market right now. And you say, well, why don't you just, you know, take a look online. You don't have to hand me your notice. And they say, yeah, I could, but I have this big deadline coming up or yeah, but my computer's at the repair shop. And for everything you say, there is a reason why they can't do it. And on the surface, these reasons sound quite reasonable. But as the conversation continues, you just notice that for everything you say, there is some kind of response. What's really happening? It's important to remember that the unconscious purpose of the agent is not to get useful suggestions, but to reject them. That's why they keep rejecting them. In my experience, what I've found with this kind of game is that the person who is the agent usually feels a sense of helplessness, so they don't feel able to change the situation themselves. And what happens is if you're person B and you're the one making the suggestions, you keep making these suggestions, they keep rejecting them, and you end up feeling their helplessness. Because essentially what they're doing is putting you in the position that they feel themselves are in. So that's unable to change, out of control of the situation, unable to do anything about it. The solution to this is not to make suggestions. It's to say, that does sound like a difficult situation. What are you going to do about it? And give the responsibility back to them. If the agent continues to push for the game, responding with, that's too bad, or something similar, will stop them in their tracks. Either you can return to adult-adult conversation where the agent is actually taking responsibility for finding solutions themselves, or they will get fed up and find someone else to play with. The second game I want to talk about is a game that Eric Byrne calls I'm Only Trying to Help. And again, like the Yes But game, I think this is one that we're all going to be able to relate to. The scenario. Person A goes to person B with a problem. Person B suggests something and person A goes away to try it. Later, they return saying it didn't work, at which point person B suggests something different. Again, A returns saying the idea was no good. Person B suggests something else, person A goes away to try it, etc, etc. What's really happening? This game is an inversion of yes but. Person B is still in parent role, but they're getting a kick out showing off their wisdom, while person A is in child mode trying to prove that their wisdom doesn't exist. The solution. The solution for this is the same as yes but, which is just not to engage. So if you recognize that you are slipping into child mode and trying to prove to the other person that they're not so wise after all and you're trying all their suggestions and it's just not working in an effort to kind of level up with them, or if you find yourself dishing out advice or suggestions out of a desire to be the wise one and to be the parent in the interaction, the most effective way to get out of the game is to take a step back and to not engage. The penultimate game I want to talk about is one called See What You Made Me Do. The scenario. Person A is painting slash fixing slash cooking, etc. 
doing something practical and potentially messy, person B interrupts and person A accidentally puts a blob of paint in the wrong place, drops a screwdriver or burns the soup. See what you made me do is the outburst. This is a really, really familiar scenario between parents and young children, but I've also seen it happen between adults, especially in relationships, so in the context of couples who either live together or are married or similar. Talking of couples, there are also more subtle versions of this game which usually interact with I'm only trying to help, and the scenario in this instance would be a wife takes on the I'm only trying to help role in the family, and over time, more and more decisions are delegated to her. Something happens, for example, the family end up in debt, leading the husband to play the you got us into this card, which is another form of see what you made me do. What's really going on? Of course, it's not person B's fault. They didn't make person A do anything. The whole point of this game is for person A to avoid blame and responsibility by laying it on person B. The solution to this is to leave the situation or to consciously give the responsibility back to the agent. The last interaction I want to talk about is one called Sweetheart. And this is a really interesting one for me because obviously when Eric Byrne wrote his book, the internet wasn't a popular mode of communication by any means. But what I've noticed is that I've seen this less in offline interactions and far, far more in online interactions. So for example, Facebook comments or forums or things like that. And it's a really passive aggressive way of interacting. The scenario for this game is that person A makes a derogatory comment followed by the word sweetheart. For example, it's like that time you forgot to pick the children up from school. Isn't that right, sweetheart? Online, this game usually occurs when someone says something similar to the above, something that is meant to be a dig, followed by a smiley face. I've definitely heard numerous variations on this game. <laughs> Sweetheart, darling, love. And I think potentially this game can also blend with the I'm only trying to help game where person A makes a derogatory comment, person B complains about it, and person A says something like, well, it's the truth, isn't it? I'm only pointing out the truth. When actually their motivation is not to point out the truth at all, it's to get some kind of emotional control in the conversation over person B. What's really going on? Person A is throwing criticism at person B disguised as an adult comment. In more complex situations, person B gets drawn into interactions with A because they know A will reveal their deficiencies without B having to do it themselves. Then it becomes a shaming exercise. The solution. There are a few ways to respond to this without getting involved in the parent-child interaction. One is to reply with something like, yes, honey, or of course, smiley face, if you're online, putting the other person's vindictiveness back where it belongs. Personally, it's not something that I would choose to do. It's very tempting sometimes, I'm not gonna deny that. But my personal feeling is that if you do that, you're playing into the game rather than stepping out of it. My favorite response to this would be to get everything out in the open. So to say something like, you can make derogatory comments about me, but please don't call me sweetheart afterwards, or something like that. Or even just set a boundary down and say, I don't like it when you make derogatory comments about me, so please don't do it anymore. That's a very brief overview of the different parts involved in transactional analysis, the parent-adult chart parts, how they can influence our interactions with ourselves, how they can influence our interactions with others, as well as some of the more common games we might experience that have been identified as part of the TA framework. Just to sum up at the end, I want to talk about the golden rules of games. Number one, games always appear as adult-adult interactions, but they aren't. Number two, games can't be won by engaging. In fact, games can't be won full stop. They can only be diffused. Number three, don't take responsibility for something that you're not responsible for. Number four, the most productive interactions are adult-adult. Number five, stay aware of how you're feeling. Stay curious of how the other person is feeling. So that's it for today. I would love to hear your thoughts about TA, so please get in touch and let me know. You can email me at hannah at becomingwhoyouare.net or hop over to the website and leave a comment on this podcast post there. 
If you're interested in exploring more about your own internal voices, one of the most effective ways that I've found to do this is through journaling. Journaling has been one of the most invaluable personal development practices to me over the last six or seven years. And last year, I published a book about it. This book contains everything you need to know about journaling. So it contains stuff like what you should use to journal, the times of day to journal, the frequency to journal, how to overcome resistance to journaling, art journaling versus written journaling, digital journaling, paper journaling. The answers to all your journaling related questions are in there, as well as over a hundred different prompts and suggestions that you can use to kickstart your journaling practice. I highly recommend journaling as an exercise to develop a deeper relationship with yourself. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can do so through Amazon where it's available for Kindle and also through my website where it's available on audiobook. Thanks so much for listening today. I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life. Thank you.